Hey, have we got a guest for you today. He is the captain of intent-based leadership, the author of Turn the Ship Around and Leadership is Language. He is indeed, if you don't know already, David Marquet. Come and join us for a great conversation where we're talking about ego, we're talking about why there are so many bad leaders, and we're talking about how you can start taking accountability and responsibility. Look forward to seeing you. Welcome to The Thinking Leader, brought to you by Red Team Thinking. Bad leaders react, good leaders plan, and great leaders think. Each week, you'll get new ideas and insights from business executives, military experts, and innovative thought leaders to help you lead more effectively and better navigate your complex world. Now, here are your hosts, best-selling business author and top-rated leadership speaker, Bryce Hoffman, and former RAF Wing Commander and Business Agility Coach, Marcus Dimbleby. Welcome back to The Thinking Leader. Marcus, we have a very special guest today that you have been working very hard to get on the show. Who is joining us today? I know, right? I've been a big fan of this man for a long time. He needs no introductions, but I'm going to introduce him anyway. He's a former U.S. Navy submarine commander, author of the fabulous book, Turn the Ship Around. I'm sure you can guess who he is by now. And then lately, he wrote the book, Leadership is Language. It's great to have on the show, joining us today on The Thinking Leader, David Marquet. David, wonderful that you could join us. Hey, thanks for having me on the show, guys. Welcome to the show, David. Wow, such a fan of your work. You have uh, really been a leader in leading leaders to become <laughs> better leaders. How many leaders can you lead? <laughs> I, well, that's, that's, that's a question. We're all about leadership here. Tell us just a little bit about how you became so reflective about leadership. I mean, there's a lot of people who've commanded submarines over the years. Yeah. And not all of them, I would hazard to say, have drawn the sort of in-depth leadership principles that you have from their experiences. Hey, th thanks. So people ask me, hey, why did I get out of the military? This is the wrong question. The question <laughs> is, why did I go into the military? <laughs> I, was, I was born in Berkeley, California in the, in the wow. late 50s. I was left-handed. I was this geeky, introverted kid. I'd be diagnosed with all kinds of social disorders at this point. And uh, I, I love math. I, I love nothing more than just sitting and reading and doing math problems. I had infinitum on to the middle of the night. Uh, but I felt passionately about the Cold War and what was going on and what and that we, quote, the West, needed to win because the idea that people could do what they want with their life, with their spouse, with their job, with their religion, their sexual orientation, whatever, to me was incredibly powerful. So what do you do if you're a, an introvert? And I read about submarines, submarines hide from people. So I said, I'm going to be a submariner. And <laughs> that's the path I, I went down. Now, uh, when I joined, when I went to the Naval Academy, the, the U.S. government, now, what did I know? I'm 17 years old. I've never seen anything. And I show up at the Naval Academy. It's this big, impressive institution. And they hand me this book. And, and the whistle blows at 4.30 in the morning. And everyone has to get up. And, and, and the book says, leadership can be defined as directing the thoughts, plans, and actions of others so as to obtain their confidence, their obedience, their obedience, and their respect. I was like, Sure. Give me some of that. And and it sets sign the world up. into this. <laughs> yes, sign me up for that. I, I'm okay, right? Whatever. Um, Make mine number, a double. Yeah. yeah, yeah, I'll take, yeah, supersize that. And <laughs> because look, here's the thing. I was being anointed into the thinking and decision-making class. And I I could picture myself as being the smart guy and I'd see what was wrong and I would tell people what to do. And, and everything in that model all your tools are either about, A, you personally making better decisions and reading the tea leaves and patterns of very uh, – war, submarine warfare is probably one of the most ambiguous things that there is on the planet because it's ambiguous because it's warfare, but it's submarine because it's underwater, so you can't see anything. So, so the 
reading the ambiguities and making good decisions. And then, and then part B is getting your team to do what you want them to do. And that was all my tools were down that path. Now, naively, I thought that being anointed into the leadership class meant that I was able to use my brain also upward, but that was of course wrong. <laughs> I was supposed to do what I was told from my boss. And I, I kind of chafed at it, but I was like, like, what did I know? So I was like, okay, great. This is how it is. And I played the game. And then I got thrust into the situation where at the very last minute, I was sent to command a submarine, uh, one of the newest in the fleet. I didn't know the ship. I never stepped on the board of this kind of submarine before. And even though externally it kind of looked the same, it was <laughs> right when we were making this transition from analog to digital. So it, it, like fundamentally, I had missile tubes that I never studied, never had dealt with before, the different re reactor plant, the, all the equipment was different. And that really pulled the rug out from under me because all my leadership was about knowing the right answer and getting the team to do it. It wasn't about getting the team to think. And I now think our language has so many artifacts of this dichotomy where some anointed group are the leaders and, and the rest are followers. And this goes way back, this goes way back to in history. Aristotle justified slavery on the basis of some humans are just born to lead and the other, some humans, most of the humans are born to follow. And this echoes yeah. throughout history. Yeah. And it's really um, immoral probably isn't too strong a word. It's just, it, it, it's wrong. It's not the right way to run a business. It's not good for humans on either side, I would argue. And it's, it's just the wrong way to think about it. But this is so deep. It's so deeply embedded in our programming. We don't even realize that it's an assumption that we're basing all of our leadership behaviors on. Yeah, it becomes a default state. And it's state. ineffectual, too. Yeah. Huge. It's ineffectual, too, in, in that, in that uh, you know, when you have this top-down command and control leadership and you're not getting creating a feedback loop, with the with the folks on the front line, the folks at the coal face, then you're missing a lot of information and a lot of ideas and a lot of insights that can help you make better decisions as a leader. Yeah, I I would I think ineffectual is a little bit harsh of a criticism. I, it's been very effective for a lot of people, uh, and if you're right, you can make a lot of money. Uh, but eventually, but it, to me, the word I use is it's fragile. Mm -hmm. Because That's if you're word. wrong, then you're going to go. So you're going to make make a hundred million, make a hundred million, make a hundred million bankrupt. And we yep. see from Wells Fargo and Boeing and other um, the, the the Russian military behavior in Ukraine, on on and on that in these in these uh, cultures, people won't speak up. You're giving people a pass on thinking, and so you're really relying on one person's big brain. And the world shifts and the person's big, who's got the big brain telling everyone what to do, doesn't see the shift. Yeah. And then everyone goes tanks. And so like, uh, like you're saying, Bryce, yeah, it, it is ultimately ineffective. And, uh, but, but then of course we blame the people that they didn't execute it as fast <laughs> as I wanted them to. <laughs> oh, well, I'm like fragile. Fragile, fragile is a yeah. good word for it. Yeah. Because I, yeah. I, I think back when, when you when you describe it that way, I think back to to one of the leaders I had an opportunity to work with a lot was Sergio Marchioni, who was the CEO of, of Fiat, the, the CEO of Chrysler, the CEO of Caterpillar, the CEO of Case New Holland, CEO of, of all these companies at once. And he first time I met Sergio one on one, he sat down, he put down half a dozen blackberries in front of him, which will date when we got together. I was like, Sergio, what's up with all the, the Blackberries? And he says, well, I got this one's for, for Fiat. This one's for Ferrari. This one's for Chrysler. This one's for... And, and, and all at the time, all of these companies were, were really successful. And he was making huge bets. He managed to talk Obama into giving him Chrysler for nothing. You know, he was, he was rolling the dice. And it was working. Like you say, it was, it was working. But it was all him. 
Yeah. And it was like such a graphic image of someone who was holding everything so closely in their hands that he had to have a separate BlackBerry for each one. I, I love that. I wish I had a picture. Because <laughs> there is, I do have one somewhere. We, I'll look and see if that, I can find it. I would love to see that. I love that picture yeah. because what the, the other thing that links to is in this structure, we need to understand that this structure was designed in the industrial age and it's called, it, it's well, it's actually probably predates that, but the permission based organization results in him having all those blackberries. Because he's an achiever, he's in the Jack Well school of I'm making all the decisions yep. and I'm the giant brain and everything, and I have these octopus tentacles out and I'm controlling everything. And we we gain a lot of psychological juice from that. We don't like to admit it, but we do. And all day long, people are, oh, Sergio, what do you should do? Oh, blah, 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 what are you, oh, David, what should I do here? Oh, wow, well, let me tell you. And what we espouse, first of all, empowerment is not binary. This is one of the biggest problems that I see in organizations. We say, oh, no, no, not I don't make a decision. You make a decision. Well, that's a very binary approach. So we like to just ratchet it from permission to intent. Intent sounds like permission, but we say, hey, uh, Captain, I intend to submerge the ship, not I'd like permission to submerge the ship. At the end of the discussion, if you say I need permission and I just turn and walk out of the control room, go down to the wardroom and have a cup of coffee. No, we're not doing no one's doing anything. Because in permission, you need yes. And the more people have to say yes, the less probability there is that things goes forward. So permission-based organizations were designed explicitly to prevent action from taking place. Yeah. That's the purpose of a permission. So if you are speaking with the language of permission, I'd like to, um, can I, mother, may I? It's designed not. And then we say, oh, why aren't things happening very fast? And we do all these things. We do a reorg and we, 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 we used to have tribes, but now we have squads. But none of that matters because we're still getting permission. So we, when you say intent, it flips the whole thing. Because with intent, you say, hey, I intend to submerge a submarine. And now we, we always talk about, we call it expose your thinking. Hey, here's why. Uh, this is what our mission calls for, blah, 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 blah. And here's why it's going to be safe. All, all personnel below. Uh, we check the water depth, blah, blah, blah. And then if I turn around and walk out of the control room, guess what happens 30 seconds later? Auga, auga, dive, dive. The, no one is waiting. So in a permission-based environment, you need all those Blackberries because the team is waiting on responses from you. And if you go on a skiing vacation, everything grinds to a halt. And if your company gets bought and you go away, your company's value is just what's innate in you. So in permission-based environment, people go to the offsite and they, they, they don't care. Because they know, oh, people send intent. Hey, this is what I intend to do. They get a response. Well, that's on you, you. You didn't respond, but that doesn't hold people up. And so it frees the leader to do higher level thinking. And in the case of Sergio, he was a chain smoker and he died suddenly. And the whole house of cards came tumbling down. Right. Right. Yeah. I mean, sorry, but that's the structure. Yep. I was really interested in what ha what happened to Apple after um, Jobs died because I never met him and I didn't I wasn't really close to the company, but I got a sense that he was kind of um, I got all the answers kind of a guy. But Apple's done well, very well. Um, I think Tim Cook's done really well, and I think there is more to uh, what we say is. Great leaders embed greatness in the processes and the people of the organization. They don't keep it Absolutely. in their own personality. And I saw, I think there was more of that going on than at least I from the outside and from the books I read could see. Yeah, I th I've worked with a lot of people who were direct reports to Steve. And, you know, the I, in a past life, I was a tech reporter in Silicon Valley in the 90s. And uh, I think the thing about, Jobs is that he he was one of those people who liked to have all the answers, but he also liked to surround himself with people that even though he could, you know, be pretty rough on at times, he surrounded himself with them because he knew they had answers too. Yeah. And so he cultivated a team. And that's the thing, you know, the, the thing I used to say about Sergio, people would ask me, what do you think of him as a leader? I'd say he's a great leader, but he's a, he, for, in the short term, but he's not building a team. So in the long term, what does it matter? 
because ultimately at the end of the day, you have to move on one way or another, right. either because you age out or retire or have a sudden heart attack. Yeah. And you become an Achilles heel of the organization, don't you? If you do that, but like Jobs says, it's his famous quote where he says, you know, you don't hire smart people and tell them what to do. The whole purpose is you hire them so they can tell you what to do. And if you're willing and humble enough to do that and have that two way, two way street of communication, that's how you get an effective chain of command operating and pushing that information down where possible to make control ab- enabled at the coal face for the frontline operations. Yeah, it's two times you said coal face. <laughs> it's one of Marcus's favorite, favorite words. So, I'm a Yorkshireman. So favorite word. Favorite. Well, I think coal employment in the UK, I think, is almost zero. At this I know, point. right. So, I know. Yeah. Alas, so, no more. Uh, the front yeah, line. Uh, we use front line. The front line. No, no, no. That's fine. Coal face. I like, I like the picture of that, too. Yeah. It, it's, I, so to me, my next book's on the book I'm working on now is on ego. Oh, I love it. Because... Uh, I, so I'm working with a partner uh, who's got a PhD in psychology. So actually, he actually knows something. His name is Dr. Michael Gillespie. And we, you, we, you're all aware of the human biases, uh, escalation of commitments, sunk cost, all of these kind of things which color the way we make decisions. And so it started out as a decision-making book, and we were looking at all these biases, which quickly becomes um, – Everyone's inventing new biases every day or renaming them. So we said, well, what's the common cause of as many of these biases as we can get? And basically it comes down to ego, not so much in, well, I'm just a bombastic jerk, but just the fact that our default reference point for experiencing the world is right here behind our eyeballs. And when we make this, so we like that, we like attention and, when we make decisions, our ego, uh, our model for the ego is is basically it it it's this entity which it fix it's fixing itself. It likes to be fixed, like a mountain climber on a going up the mountain. You want to be attached to the mountain, and the ego says, "Oh, I made that decision. Attached to that. Oh, I got a A plus on my math test. Attached to that. Oh, my mom told me I was." Um, the smart kid. Oh, attached to that. And so the problem is not these attachments so much. It's I can't release. I can't let that go and go to the next thing. So as a mountain climber, I'm stuck on the side of the mountain and I can't move forward. And so we attach to being the person who knows all the answers and I gain psychological. And so well, what am I if I'm just sitting back here quietly and when the, when the product goes really well, rather than me, the CEO standing in front of the TV cameras, the, I sent out the, the product owner <laughs> and let them take, take, the, take the juice. Absolutely. Well, this is, this is great. I want to talk more about the ego and how we get the ego to let go of the mountain. But right now, we're going to take a short break. Stay tuned. Hey, folks, Bryce here. If you're listening to this and you're liking what you're hearing and you're wondering, am I a red team thinker? We have an easy way for you to find out. Just go to the show notes, click on the link there to our free assessment to find out if you are a red team thinker and what you can do to think more effectively, to lead more effectively, and to make better decisions faster in your complex world. Like I said, the link is in the show notes, or you can simply go to our website, redteamthinking.com. Check it out. I can't wait to see how you score. I didn't want to say this because because Marcus gets mad at me because I, I talk too much about my mentor, Alan Mulally, the, the, the former Oh, Mulally's great. Yeah, I loved his book, American Idol. I got it right over I here. I wrote that. That's my book. Uh, oh, of course. <laughs> <laughs> oh, look, see. That's even better, though, because I was talking good about you without knowing I was talking Imagine good about you. I know. If you got that book of me, it's garbage. <laughs> I love it. What, did it. oh, what an idiot. How did they not put that together? Yeah. Oh, this is great. Ah, this is well, well done. Well done. This is tremendous. <laughs> Thank you. Well, <laughs> you mentioned Jack Welch. Oh, my God. I hate I, Jack Welch. <laughs> oh, me too. Yeah. So that's what I was going to say. So I wrote a piece for Forbes several years ago called Alan Mulally or Jack Welch, which type of leader are you? Yeah. It's the best read thing I've ever written for Forbes. But I wanted to tell you where it came from. I was, when when Alan retired in 2014, 
C- yeah, CNN and all the networks, of course, called me and asked me to you know come in and, and do interviews about his legacy, et cetera, et cetera. I was doing Maggie Lake's show on CNN, and she, and she was the time their main business person. And we did you know, a retrospective about Alan, future for blah, blah, blah. When it was done, when we were done recording, she said to me, she said, you know, Bryce, I have probably had at least half of the CEOs of the Fortune 100 sitting in that chair in the past 10 years, including Alan. And I have never had, I've never met anyone like Alan. And I said, it said, yeah, you know, I've covered, I used to, I was a journalist at the time. I had been a journalist right before that. I said, you know, I covered tons of companies. I never met anyone like Alan. And she said, why do you think there's, and we talked about, oh, he's, he's exactly what we need. He's the great model of leadership. We should, he should be president. We talked about that. And then she said to me, David, she said, why do you think there are so few Alan Mullallys in the world? And it's one of those things like where somebody asks you a question that's like an ice pick breaking an ice dam. Yeah. And then the something you've been thinking about for months just kind of pours out. Yeah. Without even pausing, I said to her, I said, because there's so many Welches in the world. <laughs> and and she literally, she like felt plopped back down in her chair. Yeah. And she said, Oh my God. She said, You are so right. Yeah. And yeah. we spent the next until her producers were like, Maggie, Maggie, we need the studio. You gotta get stopped. We were talking about how Jack created this model of the leader with the, you know, shooting from the hip, having all the answers. And it just became the de facto model of business leadership in this country. Hey, look, here's your first clue. Jack, yeah. who's on the cover of the Jack Wells book of Jack Wells? Jack, Jack Wells. Wells. What is Jack right. Wells name his MBA program? The Jack, Jack Wells, Wells MBA. Program. If you don't think that that whole thing is about Jack Wells, then I can't help you. Exactly. This is awesome. <laughs> This is awesome. So everybody, if you guys have not read Bryce's book about Alan Mulally <laughs> called American Icon, look, no, look, let me say this. This is great. And uh, there's so many little nuggets in this. I love, I like, it's, I have all This is not watch. a paid promotion. <laughs> not a paid promotion. No, no, pay. I paid, I paid my own $9.99 to buy this book. Yeah, this is not a paid promotion. But look, this, it really is tremendous. It's a tremendous story about a tremendous leader. But the problem is, if, if you look at Jack Welch, you say, well, what leaders did he create? Oh, well, right. these are the guys that went to Boeing and screwed it up. These yep. are the guys After like Alan Nar- yeah. Nardelli, who screwed up Home Depot, and then the New York Stock Exchange, and then some other And company, Chrysler. And Chrysler, yeah. And so why? Because they fell into the trap of thinking, what Jack Welch did, and I won't take this away from him, is he was a great achiever. Mm-hmm. He achieved a lot. Plus, he had great timing. If you bought any company in the United States, stock, or around the world probably, and the day he took over GE and sold it the day he left, you would have made a ton of money. But what he wasn't was a good leader. Because what leaders, lead the scorecard on leadership starts ticking the day you exit. Exactly. And with them, what that. we do is we see how the organization does without you. Now, imagine if you're going to give, I, I was working with the Air Force on their performance evaluations, and we, we got this close to implementing this, but they, they ended up whistling out at the very end. But the idea was, let's give the leaders, let's give the captains of the, of the, the squadron commanders an evaluation one year after they leave based on how well their organization did without them. Oh, Marcus was a wing commander. What do you think of that? Absolutely. Absolutely. Because you, you see so many people just, you can see their tours, their two, three-year tour. First year, getting away with doing nothing by working out what's going on. Second year, looking busy. Third year, hiding all the skeletons and then yeah. planning their exit. And then when they go, you know, right. within six months, a poor guy has come back in. He's spending all of his time picking up all yeah. the mess and trying to fix what's been done. I, I always said, if you plotted... Uh, the re- the uh, performance evaluations for every organization, they would go, oh, it's all screwed up. The pre- pers- and then, oh, look what, how much I'm, and oh, it's so great. Now I can leave. And then yeah. the next person comes in, it's all, well, there's this big, this, how can that be? Yeah. It can't, but the other, the thing is, how does this change your your mind, your mindset? If you know you're going to be evaluated on how your, your organization does without you, yeah. 
think of how that changes the way you interact with your team on a daily basis. And I think this is the right mindset because now you're investing in building leaders. And if you are a genius and you are fine, help them to, to be able to make the same, replicate the decision-making structures, whatever it is that you use to come up with the right answer, see the future better than everybody. Fine. Help them with that. Or probably more likely because there's so many sensors out in the organization, you gotta, you're not going to sense like Blockbuster. I can sit in the headquarters, but I'm not going to sense, even though I can read the financial numbers, what's yeah. happening in the marketplace. But I guarantee you, a lot of people who are running Blockbuster knows. stores did. Yeah. Somebody knows. Not a cold face. <laughs> Somebody yeah. knows. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Right, well, right, that's, right. that's one of our core theses, <laughs> yeah. David, is, is, you know, like I said, I used to be a financial cold journalist. Face. I've been inside hundreds of companies. I have never been inside an organization, business, government, military, because we work with all of them, that there are plenty of people who know what's wrong and how to fix it. Yeah. I mean, look at Boeing. We, we know mm -hmm. now because you saw the texts from the test pilot saying, yeah, this thing is really acting crazy in the simulator. I guess I lied to the FAA. He was saying it sort of jokingly because he was convincing the FAA that he was good to go. But it's... Every every grounding and collision that the submarine force ever had, once investigated, revealed that somebody on the crew yeah. knew or, or did like new sounds too um, deterministic, but had a sense that things were amiss. Then the ship was standing in a danger, but either didn't speak up because, well, like I must be the only like I must be wrong because yeah, I'm, I'm the, the crazy only guy. This. Yeah, I'm the crazy one. Uh, yeah. Marcus, you, you're familiar with this with from your All flying the time. time. Yeah. All the time. Uh, or maybe they said it, but they didn't really have the language. And so we gradient. think, yeah, yeah, and power gradient. So we we're programmed to ask binary questions: Is it safe? Will it work? Are you sure? Are you sure? Now, in the in a culture of binary questions, I've just set a very high threshold for. When it's not safe, and I'm going to speak up. On the other hand, if I can speak probabilistically, hey, this might not be the right thing to do, or I think we might be shooting the wrong target. How 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 sure are you? Only ten percent. Okay, but it allows us to say more. It allow it gives the team permission to be wrong is the traditional way to say it. But it's it's you're not wrong if, if the it's weather says discussion, seven, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because yeah. when you it, say ten percent, someone's like, "What? Ten percent? We shouldn't be firing." Let's just, let's talk right, about right. this. Yeah, yeah. Let's talk about what percentage do I need it yeah. to be before I don't sh shoot? Like, well, I don't know. We're in a hot war, and it's World War Two. So, yeah, whatever. We'll take the hip. <laughs> but well, this like, is the problem today, with, with no. AI and in machine in machine systems yeah. uncoupled from human decision makers is they can make great probabilistic determinations. But what to do with those determinations, I would submit, is is best done in conjunction with human decision makers when you're dealing with high stakes uh, issues in many cases. Yeah, we got Hurricane Ian bearing down on us. And but by some of the tracks, it like goes right over my house. Some of the tracks, it goes to the east. Some of the tracks, it goes to most of the tracks go to the west. But if you think of it, sort of like which where's the hurricane going will it hit us or not then i think it leads you i had this problem on the submarine oh, i think it leads you into in, into limiting your decision so i had this problem on the submarine i don't know maybe marcus saw this so we go to pick up so we're we have to pick up a seal team and we look at the weather and the weather's supposed to be good we wait for the full moon or the not the full the opposite of the full moon new moon so no 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 moonlight, dark as possible, blah, 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 blah. You optimize the conditions. What's the weather? Weather's supposed to be good. So I set a team of junior officers to go plan this operation out. It's going to happen in 36 hours. And they come back and they brief me. And I said, well, what if the weather's not? So the main plan is we're going to use the main deck on the submarine, the main deck hatch, which is only about a foot and a half above sea level. And if the weather's not good, you can't use that hatch because the waves come and they go in the submarine. Not good. So, <laughs> so I say, well, what happens if the weather's bad and it's greater than three foot waves? They're like, well, 
and, and you could tell they haven't really yeah. like they've put like one brain power, one brain cell on this. And it always frustrate me. I said, why, why aren't you guys planning out case B very well? Well, we have a plan, sort of not, but they really didn't. And yeah. and I think what happens is, let's say it's ninety percent good weather, ten percent bad. In their minds, they're like, "There's a ninety percent chance that everything I do to plan out case B is going to be a waste of time." And everyone's already busy, and yep. da, 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 da. so we just so we so we don't do it. And then when a case B happens, one in ten times, we're not ready. And that's why this planning that way in, in complexity doesn't work anymore, doesn't it? And we're seeing that. And what we're talking about here is creating plans with optionality. You have to bake yeah. those plan B, plan C into your original planning because that 10% will show up one day. And if you've not planned for it at all, that will completely make the plan fail. You know, it'll catch you totally unawares. Right. Whereas that little bit of time up front thinking and asking the right questions that triggers that thought process is what you're trying to achieve in, as you said, junior officers and our, our frontline personnel. Yeah, precisely. I love this. I I want to I want to get to this point, David. I want to go back to this point about ego. Yeah, because I, I agree with you completely that a lot of the cognitive biases and heuristics that 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 we resort to are really a product of of ego and and a product of the fear that if we ask for help, if we don't have the answer, if we're not decisive to a fault, then people will not perceive us as real leaders. And it probably gets into imposter syndrome and a lot of other things as well. How do you get people as leaders to begin to pry their fingers off the mountainside and, yeah. and relinquish some control? So the fundamental tool, uh, psychological tool is called distancing. You need to move away from you. You're locked inside. You're, we call it, you're locked behind your eyeballs. And so you can distance. I'll give you three ways to distance. One, be someone else, be somewhere else, be sometime else. Be someone else means think of yourself in the third, even something as writing a journal in third person tends to mitigate anxiety. David had a bad day today. David was upset about blah, 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 blah. Or, Whatever it is, if you, if you journal in the third person, people have alter egos. So mm -hmm. Beyonce had Sasha, Sasha Fierce, so she created. So that's kind of an extreme case of this distancing. So that's be someone else, and there's 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 other pieces to it. But just imagine that you're a different representation of your yourself. Number two is be somewhere else. So Bill Urey, I think probably got the best example of this where he talks about in negotiations. Don't imagine we we're imagining ourselves. We're on stage. Imagine yourself in the balcony, looking at yourself. Uh, and number three is be sometime else, which the most powerful way to do that is to imagine in the future. So if, if you ask a uh, psychological study for people said, uh, here's some criteria, pick the best car tomorrow, you're going to buy it. And then you're going to buy this in a year. They made better decisions if they had just imagined the decision was in a year. Then to do that on steroids, imagine you're you're in the future. So I'm I actually moved the calendar on the submarine. I had a calendar which I always had run in six months in advance, and I'd said, okay, imagine what day is it? We're at the end of September. So imagine it's the end of March, and at the end of March, I'm sitting there thinking, what would I want? What would I would want David to do? today to get and to what happens is yeah. it activates more long-term thinking because today all i want to do is solve the problem and move on but if i'm like well crap in march i'm gonna be dealing with the same issue over and over and over again i'm just going to keep solving this same problem how about i build a team of problem solvers so it allows me to say you know what you guys go go away come back in 30 minutes tell me what you think i mean let them build the team of problem solvers and not get trapped the way sergio was so, um, and then for example, we, we call it be the coach, not the quarterback. We picture ourselves on the quarterback of my life. I'm on the field, I'm throwing balls, I'm motivating my players and I get hit and I feel a sack and it hurts and I'm wrapped up in the moment, but the coach is on the sideline and he's like, yeah, that hurt. And then you come <laughs> off the field and he, he doesn't care. 
It's like, well, what are we going to do next? It's a, it's like, yeah, that happened. I'm not pretending it didn't, yeah, but move on. I don't move on. Like what? Great. Now what are we going to do next? Uh, but I'm so pit. Whatever. What are you going to do next? So be the coach of your life, not the quarterback of your life. Now there are some moments if you're climbing a mountain, be in the moment. Like don't be. <laughs> yes. <laughs> like that's a good time to be in the moment. But but before and after, a lot of times our life we're not in we're not doing those kind of things and to activate the learning vector and the and the when we're in decision making mode. Uh, we think it's better to have these different perspectives. And fundamentally, what, what it's fundamentally doing, it's separating you from what it feels like my ego. And it's easier, mm-hmm. then it's easier to let go of that thing and, and, and reattach higher on the mountain. Wow. That's such powerful, powerful advice. I love that. Distancing, letting yep. go a little bit so that you actually become more successful and, and help your organization as you say, become more successful too. Yeah, because all these fixtures are all, they're, it's all rearward looking. It's all about things that happened in the past. It's, and so the ego is fundamentally trying to f- put the past in a concrete pattern and say fixed to that way. I'm still alive. I'm pretty successful. Don't change anything. All those things are attached to me. And the thing is, we can't help it. There was a plane that... Um, Asiana 214 that crashed in San Francisco coming in. I'm sure you, yes. you, you remember this. And there was a situation. So the pilot's coming in. He's being a- monitored. So that's another stressor that pushes you, tends to push you back inside your, your own eyeballs. And uh, the lights went from four white to three white, one red, two, two, to four red very rapidly. He claimed, of course, as the plane's getting closer, so the lights are getting bigger. He, he never saw them go to four red. And he's talking, well, maybe there's a flash. The other two people in the, in the cockpit did. But I think what happened was his brain, it was such uncomfortable information. Your brain actively filters it out to protect you yeah. from this uncomfortable. So the reason he didn't see it, and, and this is not a conscious thing. This is a human thing. The reason he didn't see it was because his brain stopped it at some point from going to the conscious part of his processing. Now, that's the first problem. The second problem is when we see it, but then we deny it. We, oh, well, or we explain it. Well, you know, the reason is because, you know, this, we had the best. We did the best we can with the tools we had, blah, 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 <laughs> rationalize. Yes. And yeah. um, so that's all part of it. But but some of these things happen and you don't even have a choice over. They're already distorted before by the time you perceive it at the perceptual level, it's already been distorted in your favor. Absolutely. And that was a part of the findings in the Vincennes that shot down the Airbus, wasn't it? Where the, the radar controllers thought they saw an aircraft accelerating, descending towards a ship. And it wasn't. Right. Stayed on track at thirty seven thousand feet, but because of the context yeah. and the scenario and the pressure, that's what their brain told them to see. And so they would often. have sworn on a stack of yeah. Bibles that that's exactly what was. And then you go back and look at it and say, whoa, whoa, what? Yeah. This, is, this is not what? This, someone had altered the tapes. But if you take yourself away they from did. it. They yeah. did. They did swear that that yeah, was they until they saw the tapes yeah. again. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 Cognitive dissonance. I know. So we talked yeah. about a great book. Yeah. Here's another one. <laughs> Turn the ship yeah. around. Now, this book, David, is 10 years old this year, isn't it? Yeah. 10 years yeah. old. Wow. I know. Time flies. I've been reading your, uh, if I wrote TTSA, Turn the Ship Around, I'd do something. And the one I loved was yeah. I'd, I'd spend more time on the times when I was rigid about the rules we were going to live by. That sounds yeah. counterproductive to a lot of the stuff you talk about. Talk me through that because I find it, I understand it totally, but let's yeah. our listeners understand it from you. Yeah. So... Uh, when we go work with, uh, I had the problem on the submarine, but also uh, when we go work with companies and they say, oh, uh, you're the empowerment guy. You're the uh, give people the ability to make decisions guy. I say, yeah, yeah, yeah. So they immediately jump to, so I can do whatever I want, whenever I want, however I want. And like yeah. Agile <laughs> chaos. <laughs> no, that is not right. The way I think about it is I used to, if you think about your decisions as a product that your company produces and they're coming off an assembly line. Uh, I think about the product very um, 
in a very sort of process oriented way where we've got, most of us have gotten away from, well, I'll put an inspector at the end to make sure it's good or bad, but I'm going to make sure that we have the right spray nozzles for the paint. And when the car comes off the assembly line, it's quality is baked in. But when it comes to decisions, we do, we're still back with the assemb- with the inspector at the end. And I'm the key inspector. So the decisions are, the decision process is not well-defined. It's semi-chaotic. The decisions are randomly uh, good or bad. And then I feel good because, oh, look, bad, bad, don't do that. Yeah, good, do this. And I get psychological juice out of that. So the idea is think about your decision making as a process. And so so I was rigid where I was rigid was now about the decision making process. So, for example, we had some protocols for you needed to talk to some other people before you made a decision. You needed to think about certain things like a why are we doing it and b like how, what is ensuring that it's safe blah 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 uh we we the way we ask ran meetings for example was we would vote first then discuss and the tendency is to hey is uh 737 max good to go oh yeah blah 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 we got to catch up to airbus and then but when you vote first and we ask how how ready is 737 max to go out to public then people vote unanchored and unbiased by the group. Mm -hmm. Now, here's where I was rigid. We also had a rule, no they on Santa Fe. So if you came up to me and said, well, we, or they ordered the wrong part, so I can't fix my pump. I just walked away from you. I didn't, because the the rule was no they on Santa Fe. So the, the structural process rules, I was a, I was very rigid on. And, but because I was rigid there, I could release control Mm -hmm. on when the team came to me and said, here, we thought about it. We think we've got conflicting evidence. We should go North. We should go South. I think we should go North. Uh, Yeah. We're 65% sure about that. So I say, okay, fine. Let's go North. See what happens. Yeah. And I think that's where organizations are struggling, aren't they? Because they're reading your book. They're seeing agile self-managing, self-organizing teams, and they think it is letting yeah. go of the reins completely without what you talk about, is competence and clarity. And if you don't have yeah. those two things in spades, then right. you're not going to have that control or the authority and ability to control without being very dangerous, which we, we've seen in so many organizations since then. Yeah. I got that problem in my own, in my own consulting company. And we, the problem is, so competence, I can't give you authority to make decisions about whatever fill in the blank, if you don't know whatever the fill in the blank. So the first question is, how much do you know about fill in the blank? And that requires people to expose their level of competence, which many, I have coaches on, on our team, which don't like the idea that I can drop in and watch their thing at any time and look at the slides they're going to use anytime and that any time we can be and that they, they get defensive over that. And so it's not a good fit. Yeah, absolutely not. Right. Because, so we say invite, embrace the inspector and invite scrutiny. Don't create a team that gives feedback. No one gives a hoot about your unsolicited. <laughs> that's the, <laughs> right. that's it's the not, dirty. It's, no one, yeah, right. No it's one cares. It's not about singing kumbaya. Yeah, exactly. It's, it's, it's about, yeah. yeah, yeah. So we say create a, a culture where people invite feedback. But like, let's be honest. Bryce says after, oh, hey, Bubba, you're kind of, you can I give you some feedback? The story you told was a little bit long. It's like, I'll smile and say, oh, yeah, oh, thanks for that, Bryce. But the real deep down, I'm like, screw you, dude. Like, what do you know? <laughs> I was just listening to a, an, inter, an interview between Tim Ferriss and Tony Faddle, one of the great visionaries of Silicon Valley, worked with Steve Jobs, you know, on the iPhone and all this stuff. And Faddle was saying, you have to know what type of asshole to be. Yeah. And, and, he, and he unpacked Good point. It, and he yeah. said, if you're abusive, if you're putting people down, if you're belittling people, that's a bad asshole. But he said, if you care passionately about the product and you're going to push people to get it right because that's what that's what the customers need and and to execute the vision that you've all agreed to as a team and hold people accountable you may have to act like an asshole sometimes yeah. to do that but it's yeah. a different thing from just beating people about the the face and head 
Yeah. I so I if I were to lay into that, I would say I was a process asshole and I tried to which allowed me to release being an outcome asshole. I think too many of the times we have we, we we do it both ways where we take we have randomized outcomes. I just say imagine that your job you're buying a lottery ticket and then you win the lottery. Say, oh great job. You won the lottery. Good decision. And then you didn't win the lottery. Oh bad decision. Like well it's a randomized outcome. Yeah. So yeah. for me, and, and your ego is part of this too, because your ego attaches to the, out, likes to attach to outcomes. So then I say, oh, uh, oh, and back in 2005, I sold my house and then it was the, how, oh, how smart am I? But it was just a randomized, <laughs> you, you were just moving from San Francisco to Vegas and blah, blah, blah. And then you try and replicate that and it doesn't happen. And now you're all confused. Well, it was just a random outcome. So, but the process we don't have control over the outcome. We have control over the process. And also, by the way, trying to hold people accountable for outcomes is the best sports teams try to be agnostic about whether you won or lost. They say, look, let's just, like, if you look at John Wooden stuff or um, Trevor Mawad, the coach psychologist stuff, sports coach, then it's about, look, let's just do what we have control over. It's about aligning your focus on what you can control. And, re and release the rest. And I think accountability comes into it. You have to have accountability mm -hmm. on your team. When for the process, we, for the things you can control. For the process, exactly. Not for the outcome, for the right. process. Right. Yes. Well, here's, well, people say, well, how'd you hold people accountable? Which is weird because I never really felt I had to. The, the reason we, we have that word is because we say things like this, Bryce. Okay, Bryce, you're going to deliver a 50,000 word manuscript in six months. You have this much thing. You have this many people on your team. You got this many resources. You can have this much quality. And then I'm going to hold you accountable when you didn't, you and you came short. Well, it's like, that seems unfair. I really didn't have control over any of the input variables. Like, then oh, COVID yeah. But, happened. Yeah, yeah. And then COVID <laughs> happened. I couldn't enter. No one wanted to get interviewed. <laughs> so, um, yeah. So, but if you say, well, what did you do? Well, I just felt sorry about myself for six months and didn't do anything to get out of bed. Well, okay, well, then maybe that's something we can talk about. But we would yeah. always try and hold people accountable for the process. I was talking to my son the other day. He's a lawyer in D.C., works for a nonprofit. And he's like, Dad, you ever make any goals for yourself? I said, no, never a one, which is what, sort of totally true, but I kind of wanted to push it a little bit. He's like, what, really? He's like, yeah, I just said, I would just say, okay, if I want to do this, so let's say you want to retire with a million dollars. You can't control that, but I can right. control, I'm going to save 10% of my paycheck and, and it's going to automatically go even before I see it into an account that it's very hard for me to get the money out of. Um, and it's going to invest in a broad market index. And I'm just going to do that, do its thing. And then if the stock market crashes, well, you can't control it, but don't hold, feel bad about the outcome because right. the process was correct. Yes. I love it. This is such great stuff, David. So many great pieces of advice for leaders in all of this. It's like a master class in leadership here. It really is. It is. It's been such a pleasure having you on the show. Thanks you guys so much are, for taking the you time. You guys are awesome. Things. Look, I'm so embarrassed. I didn't I didn't put this together. I'm <laughs> no, feel like no, 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 a no. fucking an idiot. But but this, no, this, no, no. look, use some of that. This I this is true. Like I do not say it's a good book if I don't think it's a good book. This was great. Awesome. And well, I'd you. like to come back and interview you on ego because we're the problem we have is we have a lot of the negative stories. We don't have enough mm. for the good stories. And since you talked to I think Malayli could be an example of this. And I'd love to. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah, love to talk about it. I'll follow up with an email with uh, Mike Gillespie, my um, co-author. And uh, we'll, just do, we'll just do a short thing. But the question is, like, what tools did you see him? Like, I, I, I can't be too easy. Like, I want to see him struggling with this. And what, how did he deal with it? What were the tools that he used to... And you know the construct of the whole book, so you can think about that. We will have a great conversation on that. You will indeed. Right. I'm looking forward to the book as awesome. well. Awesome. Thanks so much. Brilliant. All right. Cheers, hey, David. Thanks, you guys. Have Stay a great safe as day. well.
hope the uh, hurricane pushes on by out west. Yeah, yeah, that would be better for us. Just go. Thank you for tuning in to The Thinking Leader. Check the show notes for more information about the topics covered in this episode there. You'll also find a link to our free assessment. Click on it right now to find out if you are a red team thinker with a red team culture.